Good morning. We'll begin this morning with number 221. 221. Sunshine in my soul. Let's sing all three verses before our scripture reading and prayer. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today, a carol to my King, and Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today, and hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now, for joys laid up above. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sunshine, while the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Our scripture reading this morning will come from Proverbs, the third chapter, verses 1 through 6. Proverbs 3, 1 through 6. My son, do not forget my law, but test your heart. But let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life, and peace will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on a tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have this morning to come and, and study your word and to worship you. We pray, God, that you will be with our teachers this morning. We pray that you will help them to recall the things that, in which they have studied and prepared to say. We pray, God, that they will um, say those things that would be uh, most needed for us to hear, and we pray that you will be with us as students, that we may take those things and apply them to our lives, and so we may let our light shine for you. We pray that you will be with those who are sick. We pray that you will bring them back to a better state of health, be with those who are traveling, help them get to their destination safely and back. We pray that you will be with our military, Pray that you will uh, be with them at this time and also be with their families. Pray that you'll continue to be with the, the church that meets here. Pray that you'll continue to bless us, be with our elders. Pray that you'll give them the, the wisdom that they need to make the decisions that they need to make. Pray that you'll go with us now to the rest of this service. Watch over us always. Forgive us when we sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We welcome you this morning to the Bremen Church of Christ for our Bible study period. Thank you for your presence. We do have visitors among us. We're grateful to have you here. 
We'll dismiss now to our classes with the nursery preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school. Middle school, high school, and adult classes dismissed. of Jude in this class. Good to see each of you here this morning. We're going to continue our studies. We were <clears throat> just kind of winding up verse 3 in our study, verses 3 and 4 in our study last week. Jude writing to brethren, those who are sanctified, those who are called, those who are preserved in Christ. As mentioned in verse 1, uh, verse uh, 3, there is obviously <clears throat> other reasons that he wanted to write a letter to these brethren, but felt uh, more needful to write unto them and exhort them to earnestly contend for the faith. And we have talked about what the faith is, the gospel system. The word faith here is used much as it is in Galatians chapter 3 in which Paul writes, But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. Contrast between the law of Moses and the gospel of Christ. And so that faith <clears throat> has been delivered. We noted as well that he says, Contend for the faith once delivered. That word once, as we noted, means once for all time. That eliminates any modern day Revelation, And so when people uh, began to talk about the fact that, that uh, God has spoken to them, the Holy Spirit has spoken to them, they've had something new revealed to them in some way, shape, form, or fashion, then you know that they are contradicting what Jude says in verse 3 of this letter. And so it's a good verse to keep in mind whenever people want to use that kind of language in a modern-day setting. It's just not that way. Now, it's in important <clears throat> that they earnestly contend for the faith. For what reason? In this context. <clears throat> All right. All right, he uh, goes ahead to, uh, you'll notice the beginning of verse 4, 4. That's, he's about to state the reason why he just got through saying what he did. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained of this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so there is already a problem. Those who are creeping in, and we talked about that, how they slip in. They don't boldly come in and proclaim that they're false teachers, that they're going to lead these brethren away, but they crept in. By virtue of the way they come in, says something about their motives and their intent. And so whenever people begin to, you know, work underground, so to speak, uh, you know, generally, they are up to something. Uh, if, you're, if everything is in harmony with the gospel, why do we have need to slip around, 
creep around, creep in, act as if we've got something to hide. What are we trying to hide when that's the case? We're trying to hide something. And so when you run into a situation like that, it ought to immediately raise a red flag because those who promote the gospel of Christ have absolutely nothing to hide. These have crept in, and he says that they have uh, crept in unawares. It would seem that Jude has found out something that even the brethren to whom he's writing didn't know. And he's trying to warn them in that regard. He's trying to alert them, if you please. Now remember, if you're taking the little note headings that I've, I've given you along the way, in verse 1, he's making them aware of, of who they are, the called, the sanctified, the preserved. In verse 2, he is trying to get them to have appreciation for who they are, how they got to where they are by virtue of the mercy and the love of God that brings the peace that they can enjoy. In verse 3, he's in the first part of the verse trying to arouse them, trying to wake them up, if you please, to what is taking place. And also in verse 3, he is trying to get them to be an armed people because if they're going to earnestly contend for the faith, they're going to have to be armed to do that. Now, how do we arm ourselves to contend for the faith? <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God. And as we often emphasize, every piece of armor that is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6 is directly connected with the Word of God. You cannot be armed adequately if you're not familiar with the Word of God, what it teaches. Uh, how do we recognize false doctrine if we don't know what the truth is? And I think that's one reason so many brethren are so easily led away with smooth-talking false teachers. You remember the Bible talks about those who put forth good words and fair speeches? And it does what? It perverts the hearts of the simple. And the idea is there, those who are not knowledgeable of the Word of God. If we know what the Word of God says, and then we hear something contrary to that, what do we know? We've got a false teacher among us. Whether he is intentionally teaching false doctrine or whether he is just mistaken himself. We have a good biblical example, do we not? of one who was teaching error ignorantly. Who was that man? Yeah, a little louder. <laughs> All right. Apollos. And uh, what was he teaching? John. Teaching the baptism of John. And so um, Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and taught him the way of the Lord more perfectly. And we have evidence that he continued then teaching the truth as opposed to the false doctrine. So he needed straightening out on whether the baptism of John was still effective or whether now there's something different, and there was at that point. And so he was not deliberately teaching men error, and so it's possible today that men can be false teachers ignorantly, unintentionally. But it's also possible, and is in fact the case, that there are those who do teach it intentionally. Uh, I, I've had people say, you, you really believe that somebody would just deliberately teach error? Well, inspiration says they would. God says they would. I have no reason to question God in that regard or any other regard for that matter. And so um, Paul talked about uh, those who were teaching error, and he said of them whose, whose God is, who is their God? their belly, their own belly. They were doing what they were doing for what they personally could get out of it and were unconcerned about what it was doing to anybody else. So in this particular case, it seems evident that, that these false teachers had crept in, and he says, unawares. And he's wanting to warn these brethren of what's taking place even among them. And so that's what he's doing 
and we've, we've talked about that, turning the grace of God into uh, lasciviousness. They were perverting the gospel, making it appear as if the gospel would uphold a gross fleshly conduct, sinful conduct. You remember in the, look back at Galatians chapter 5, just, uh, not Galatians chapter 5, Romans chapter 5. In the closing part of Romans chapter 5, and in the first part of chapter 6, Paul deals with something very similar to this. When in um, chapter 5, closing part of chapter 5, in verse um, 20 and 21, Moreover, the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? When you look back at verse 20, But where sin abounded, grace did abound much more. Well, if you're not careful, what, you, what might be your conclusion there? Well, I'm going to sin more, so grace will abound more. And so he addresses that and says what? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And so that is a similar thing, although there it would have been the conclusion that we're doing what we're doing sinning-wise so that grace will abound more. little different concept than here in the book of Jude, but, but in principle the same thing. That is, the gospel will uphold these kinds of sins. And, uh, but that is certainly not the case. They were turning God's amazing grace into a cheap grace to cover their indulgence into these various sins. And the grace of God does not do that. And so Paul argued against that. Liberty does not excuse ungodliness. In the Galatian letter, chapters 3 and 5, Paul deals with that concept that, yes, you have been set free. Free from what? Free to do whatever we want to, whenever we want to, how we want to? Absolutely not. We're free from sin. We're free from the law. But we're not free to do whatever we want to do. And so that freedom must not be misunderstood. That seems to be pretty much the case right here in the book of Jude. Uh, they were teaching that the grace of God and that the gospel of Christ and the freedom that it provided, provided a freedom for lasciviousness. And it does not do that. And, and so Jude is, is trying to get these brethren alerted to, to what is taking place in that regard. The grace of God is not some, come, some kind of an umbrella that shields us from sin. Never intended to do that. As a matter of fact, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, what does Paul say the grace of God teaches us to do? To deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Well, these people are saying that the grace of God would allow ungodliness and worldly lust doesn't work that way teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly righteously and godly in this present world and so uh, it's interesting how how people have described the grace of God and again some have just described it as an umbrella that does not allow sin into our lives Exactly. It just, uh, it, it just takes care of everything without any responsibility on our part. Uh, some have described the grace of God as like a, like a windshield wiper on a car, that whenever sin comes, God's grace just wipes it right off. Um, is that the case? No, because there is human responsibility. Whenever we sin, can we be forgiven? Yes. How are we forgiven? We're forgiven by the grace of God, right? But 
the grace of God is conditional, isn't it? That's the point that they're missing in all of this. The grace of God is conditional. Based upon our confessing our sin, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. Based upon our repenting of sin, uh, Acts 8, 22, repent and pray that perhaps the thought of thine heart might be forgiven thee. So uh, while, while the grace of God will cover sin, while the grace of God will wipe away sin, it doesn't do it independently of our responsibility in that regard. And so um, you cannot have that forgiveness without complying with the conditions and the regulations uh, that are connected therewith. And so that's, that's basically what he's tried to do in these, in these first four verses. He's tried to help them understand who they are, have an appreciation of how you got to where you are, be aroused that there is a problem, be alert, be alarmed at what's taking place among you. And he's done that in the first four verses. Now when we come down to verse 5, he's going to give actually all the way down through verse 19. We'll break it up a little bit more than that as we go through here. <clears throat> but actually verses 5 through 19, he gives a, a description that will enlighten these brethren concerning the matter of apostasy. And so that's, as I mentioned earlier, that's kind of the main theme of the book of Jude, uh, apostasy. If there is the impossibility of apostasy, then what would be the basic lessons that we could learn from the book of Jude? Be pretty much a useless book. Pretty much useless. If there is the impossibility of apostasy. But there is that possibility. And that's what he's going to discuss in these next few verses. You'll notice in verse um, 5, then he said, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now one thing that you need to, to kind of underscore, at least in your own mind, is that all of the examples that he's going to give in these next several verses, the underlying problem is unbelief. Unbelief. What is the basic problem of disobedience? Unbelief. Unbelief. And so he begins at the very outset here of, of setting that forth. And so, so he gives three cases here of apostasy and the consequences of each of them. And that's going to help these brethren and encourage these brethren. Don't allow these folks who have crept in unawares to lead you away from this faith that has once been delivered to the saints. Because if you do, here is a case study after case study after case study of where you're headed when that happens. Is it any different for us today? Absolutely not. That's why this is, this is such an important book even for us. Because we learn from these same examples. That if we depart from the faith, whether we deliberately do it, whether we through our own ignorance, or allow ourselves to be led away, here's where we're headed. And there's not going to be any excuse come judgment in that regard. So he talks about the, the divine vengeance upon evildoers in that regard. So he's going to deal with, with all of this concept of apostasy. And, and um, you know, it, it's interesting that in our day and time, among some of our brethren, they seem to have a problem describing and recognizing apostasy. Well, all they need to do is read the book of Jude. Jude gives some very vivid description here of, of what apostasy is. Jude didn't have any problem recognizing it and pointing it out. 
And yet we've got folks around today who just don't want us to get involved in that kind of thing. What does Jude say in verse 3? Earnestly contend for the faith. And you can't do that without knowing what apostasy is and without pointing it out when it happens. So Jude, Paul, uh, you, you think about, for example, back in um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, Paul's writing, of course, the church at Corinth was a, a problem-torn church anyway. But in uh, chapter 10 and verse 1, more of a brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized and unto Moses and the cloud in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. And, but then you'll notice coming on down to verse 5, but with many of them, who? Those that he just described. Those that were led out by Moses. Many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What's happened to them? They turned away from God. Apostasy, if you please, in that generation. And so he wants the, Paul understood that. Uh, and then there are, of course, other writers in that same regard uh, concerning the matter of apostasy. But now when you think about it, and notice the, this um, last phrase in verse 5, uh, after destroyed them that believed not. Now, in that connection, back up to the book of Hebrews. Because in the, in the book of Hebrews, the writer there describes the very same circumstance that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, uh, personally... I believe that Paul wrote Hebrews. There may be some question in that regard, but irregardless. Ever who wrote Hebrews talked about the same thing here that Paul talked about when he wrote to the church at Corinth. Look at what he says in Hebrews chapter 3. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. And he, he goes on down and talks about who's over a house and whatever. Now look at uh, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness." When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have made, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Then what does he say? Learn from this, folks. Learn from this. Beware, lest the same thing happen to you. Well, see, that's good advice for us, isn't it? And so when Jude writes about those uh, people who were brought up out of Egypt, Hebrews writer does the same thing. Uh, that's, that's what we have in these verses. Chapter 4, you, you have basically the same thing. And there's a lot more on in, in chapter 3 that we did not notice. But, but what's the bottom line? They believe not. Unbelief. Does it seem odd to you that people who could observe the ten plagues, that the people who observed and participated in the crossing of the Red Sea, people who evidence miracle after miracle, could be considered people of unbelief. Yeah, that, that's amazing. That's amazing, isn't it? But now think about it a minute. How much more evidence do we have today than those people who came up out of Egypt have? We 
we've got a whole lot more evidence than they had. What's the problem today? Unbelief. Unbelief. And so while it may seem strange that those people who, who saw all of that could be categorized as people of disbelief, yet the evidence has continued to build through the years. Life of Christ. What does John say in the closing part of his account of the gospel, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31? Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But in view of all of that, what's the problem? Unbelief. And so the, the evidence has mounted through the generations from the creation until the end of Revelation. And of course, it, it continues to mount even for us who believe today. And so what he's doing here with regard to apostasy and if you want some more subheadings, we've, we've covered those now in verses 1 through 4. In verses 5 and following, I'm going to give you some subheadings about apostasy. In verses 5, 6, and 7, he gives three cases of apostasy. Three cases. He begins with those who, who came up out of, uh, out of Egypt. Namely, the, uh, you've, you've had the formation of the of the nation of Israel down in the, let's see now, where did they settle in Egypt? In the land of Goshen. Best part of Egypt, wasn't it? And so that nation now has been formed. They have been, they have become oppressed. They have called out to God. God has sent a deliverer in the name of Moses with the assistance of Aaron. They've been brought out. Now, as a result of unbelief, what's happened? They've been overthrown. Because of their unbelief, they believe not. Afterward, God destroyed them because of unbelief. And so, um, why are these examples? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, it would certainly show the destiny of these false teachers and, and anybody that follows them. So you, know, you need to be concerned that these people exist and what their destiny is. And number two, you need to understand as well that if you follow them, you're going to have the same destiny. There's not going to be any excuses in that regard. You recall the last verse of Romans chapter 1 when Paul had talked about those who knew God but glorified Him not as God, became vain in their imaginations, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, and then he lists that long list of sins that are committed by those who do not like to retain God in their knowledge. But he said not only those that do the same, but what? All those who have pleasure in them that do them just as guilty. And so we're not just concerned about the false teachers and their destiny. We ought to be concerned about that. But we need to be concerned about our own destiny if we are not so armed. Go back to those first four verses. Realize who you are. Appreciate how you got there. Be aroused to the problem. Arm yourselves to deal with the problem. Because if you don't, here's your destiny. Here's your destiny. So that's really what is involved here in, in these. So, so all of these things that, that Paul is going to mention, and of course the first example here is the, is the sin of, of unbelief of the nation of Israel. So Jude doesn't want these brethren to, to be lost because of unbelief. The second example that he uses is in verse 6. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, hath, uh, he hath uh, reserved in everlasting chains under darkness 
under the judgment of the great day. So here's the second example of proof that the punishment of the wicked is inevitable. He first shows the unbelief of the nation of Israel. Secondly, he shows disbelief, unbelief, among those what we would refer to as celestial beings, angels, in this regard. Unbelief leads to disobedience. That's the way he described them here in this regard. They kept not their first estate. Rebellion, pride, is the basic problem in this example. The proverb writer said, pride goes before what? Destruction and a fall. What do we have described here in verse 6? A fall. So pride is obviously involved in that. Um, in Second Peter uh, chapter 2 and in verse 4, For if God spared not who? The angels. Well, see, Peter and Jude are, as we sometimes say, on the same page, aren't they? Their thinking is along the same lines, and that would stand to reason since they're both writing by inspiration. So Peter talked about the angels that, that were not spared. Jude talks about the angels that were not spared. Angels, and that's a whole different study that we're not going to get into this morning, but, but they are created beings and obviously beings of choice where they arbitrarily cast out of their first estate? No, there's no indication of that. Something of their own doing, something of their own choice. Have you ever done a detailed study of angels? It's quite interesting when you study that subject from cover to cover. Uh, a lot can be learned. Maybe some things we don't know when we get through with that study, but we can learn a lot about angels and their place in God's scheme of things. But, but they were created beings, beings of choice, who obviously made a choice that was rebellious to the will of God. They left, or they kept not their, their first estate. The word estate there, their first principality, their first position is the idea. It's, it's somewhat a, a term of description of an office or position. So whatever their office was, whatever their position was, he says here that they left that. They kept it not. And so there were wicked angels, just as there are wicked men. So when you, you know, what, what, when you allow yourself, or when you allow yourself to believe that which is wrong, what's going to be the ultimate lifestyle? It's going to be wrong, isn't it? So what we believe, and what we allow ourselves to believe, can determine how we behave. You think about that in, in matters of religion just a moment. If I believe and I allow myself to believe that one church is as good as another, how am I going to behave? Well, I'll go here one Sunday, and I'll go there next Sunday, and I'll be this for a while, and I'll be that for a while. I had a um, good tennis buddy up in, up in Tennessee whose sister was the music director at a large, very prominent Baptist church in the area. And then one day this friend of mine said, well, my sister's moving, uh, I think, to, I don't know, McMinnville, Manchester, somewhere. And I said, well, what is she going to be doing down there? Well, she is going to be the music director of the First Methodist Church down there. And I said, excuse me? Well, one church is as good as another. 
Well, if I believe that and allow myself to believe that, then that's how I'm going to act. Just like one's as good as another. It doesn't really matter. In this case, if I allow myself to believe that the gospel will uphold lascivious behavior, then what am I going to do? How am I going to behave? in the ways of lasciviousness. Anything goes. doesn't really matter. If I believe that, that the more I sin, the more grace I'm going to have, what am I going to do? How am I going to behave? Well, I'm going to go out and commit every sin I can think of because I want that grace pouring in. So what we allow ourselves to believe will affect our behavior. That's true in every aspect of life. It's true in husband-wife relationships. It's true in parent-child relationships. It's true in our secular areas of work. It's true in our recreational pursuits. Whatever I believe can very well determine how I'm going to behave. That's why it is so important that we believe what? That we believe the Bible. We believe the Word of God. And whatever the Word of God says, regardless of what it says, we're going to believe it. And we're going to behave accordingly. Robert, you have a... Um, well, the de general definition that I had, had given earlier was gross fleshly behavior. Uh, it, it, the word lasciviousness can can cover more than just one specific sin. But, but any kind of gross fleshly behavior, fornication, adultery, bestiality, any, I mean, it, it covers, it, it's a pretty broad term, actually. Uh, some, some versions uh, just give the word wickedness there. But it, it's generally connected with fleshly misconduct. Um, that's why, that's why we use the word sometimes when, for example, when we're discussing the matter of, of dancing and the modern dance and the movements that are involved in the modern dance are lascivious in nature because they portray fle gross, fleshly, sinful conduct. And so we, we often use it in that connection. But that's, that's the general meaning of the word. All right, so he's given us the example of, of um, the Israelites who've come out of Egypt because of unbelief. They were destroyed. He's given us the example of the angels because of, of pride, because of their rebellion, because of their unbelief. They've now left their first position or office, whatever that was, and we're not told here what that was. Now we'll pick up there, Lord willing, um, two weeks from today. Next week we'll be involved in our campaign. We'll pick up there in a couple of weeks and we'll look at the third example, another one of which we are very familiar, Sodom and Gomorrah, and go from there. Hey, how are you? I'm good. <laughs>